Christmas. Tomorrow evening we will have a Christmas, our Christmas Eve service at 6 p.m. We'd love it if you can join us for that. Christ candle will be lit all night. Uh, other announcements. Uh, no disciple classes, disciple students, no until after the first year. No Wednesday night activities until after the first of the year. We hope you're able to enjoy um, Christmas um, holiday season and enjoy it with family and friends. We welcome you today, all of you that were here for the first time. We're here for the first time a long time. We're here for the first time since last Sunday. We're glad you're here with us. Just one correction, the bullets are not really a correction. The opening prayer will be a part of the Advent candle lighting, so um, we're not skipping that. It will be a part of the candle lighting service. Um, the flowers under the cross this morning uh, are there, placed there by the Myrtle Lion Circle. Again, they are very beautiful. There are Christmas cards in the foyer in the card box. Um, if you have not gone through that, if you haven't gone through it lately, please do so. There are several cards in there, and they, some of them may have your name on them. So please uh, go through as the service is over, and uh, hopefully find a card with your name on it. Are there other announcements this morning? Uh, on behalf of Marva Jean, I want she wanted to thank everyone for all the food and all the donations they gave, gave her over the last couple of months. But in the library, there's a cardboard box over there that's got pie pans and plates and bowls and everything with your names on. So please, uh, please pick them up in the library. And again, she's very appreciative of it, except for the 20 pounds she's gave her. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other announcements this morning? Seeing none, would you take a moment to find someone who's not yet welcomed and greet them? <laughs>
creature that there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch on the flock by night. The angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. You know, they were out there. <laughs> but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of a great joy for all the people. <coughs> to you is born this day in the city of David, the Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in the manger. You guys get rid of that mic. The camera. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those who he favors. The shepherds were frightened when the sky was suddenly flooded with a brilliant light. Not only did the message of the angels calm their fears, but this announcement meant that the long awaited prophecy had been fulfilled. As we follow Jesus today, we know that the Spirit of God is always with us. God still speaks. God makes announcements today that bring life, hope, love, joy, and peace to the world. Help us turn aside from our business to experience the presence of the one who brings life above us.
Olivia up at the front this morning. Down the thistle. But I heard him exclaim as he drove. 
go down the site. Merry Christmas to all and to all. some of it this morning, but we're going to read it again, too. And it came to pass in those days, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is Bethlehem. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in his swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds, keeping watch over their flocks. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord showed around, around about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the baby wrapped in Swaddled clothes lying in a manger, and suddenly there were, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of hev of the heavenly host praising God and saying, "Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward." Okay, now you know two, one poem and a story that we need to remember as we're celebrating Christmas. It is the birthday of Jesus. And if you've seen that old movie, The Grinch, The Grinch says, Maybe Christmas, he thought, does it come from a storm? Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. <laughs> Happy birthday, Jesus. <coughs>
That's the third time I've heard that song. It gets better every time. But it's the first time I've heard it while standing, sitting next to you. <laughs> so, thank you. Wonderful. All of you, choir. We'll go to the Lord in prayer at this time. And uh, we want to invite you during our time of prayer today um, to lift up the names that upon your heart during our time of as we pray together. And, um, we'll get back to bring Mike's room to the next week. But during our time of prayer, during the time of silence, you'll know when. Lift up the names that are upon your hearts. The Lord, the Lord knows what the need is. Would you join me in the word of prayer? Eternal God, on this day, as we approach the birthday of our Savior, we are reminded, Lord, more and more, as we look into your word and as we hear of all that goes on in our world around us, that the world that our Savior entered long ago wasn't much different from the world we live in now. You chose not to enter a perfect world, but you entered a world that was full of brokenness. And Lord, and you entered the world of two people that were challenged with the very moment you arrived. And yet, Lord, we know that in our world, full of its challenges, Lord, in our own personal worlds, Lord, the challenges we face, that you are with us today. We pray, God, for each one here in this place. We pray for the churches near and far. We pray for our country and our world today. Lord, we pray, God, that each of us hold the real meaning of Christmas in our hearts. And that through all this, Lord, we look towards you for everything. For you are our everything. We pray for those today who, in the midst of a time of great joy, they discover everything well. We pray, God, for those today who mourn during a time where they should not have to mourn. We pray for those, Lord, whose life is full of trouble. Yet, God, we pray that they know the peace that the Prince of Peace can bring. We pray today for those sitting near us. For though we come here to worship you, we also often come here to discover you. And let our prayer be, Lord, for the neighbor around us, that they might discover you in this place today. Hear, Lord, our prayers. Now, help us pray once again the prayer that our Lord taught his disciples long ago. <coughs> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it is not to temptation, but deliver us from evil.
join me in prayer. Oh Lord God, on this day, as we give praise unto you, help us, Lord, remember that you are worthy of our praise each and every day. And Lord, help us, Lord, be givers not only during this time, but throughout the year. Lord, giving generously, Lord, where we may be able to do so. Lord, but in every way, help us, Lord, remember that we are your church. And God, we are called to be the light of the world. And help us to take the good news that we know to a world that is lost. Bless this offering, we pray. Bless your people, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Give you a little background on this beautiful song we're going to do. Thank you to uh, Dean and Trisha for inviting me to be a part of this. 200 years ago, in a little town in southern Austria, there was a traveling group that went around doing the nativity scene. But the organ in the church was broken, and so they had to have the play in a private residence. The assistant pastor named Joseph Moore, as he went home that night, took a different route. And he looked back over the little town there in Austria and how beautiful it was. And it reminded him of a poem that he had written a few years earlier. And he was so upset that the organ was broken and there wouldn't be music for the Christmas Eve service. And so he got with his organist, Franz Gruber, and said, can we put, more, put music to this poem so we could do it with a guitar? And so that Christmas Eve, for the first time, they sang this song as Hans Gruber played the guitar. A hundred years later, on the battlefield in Europe, during World War I, a stillness came over the battlefield on Christmas Day. And the German soldiers started singing the song. And the British soldiers recognized it too. And they joined in. And for a few hours, in the middle of a heated battle, there was a truce. Because of what this song represents. In 1863, when West Virginia became a state, this song was translated from German into English for the first time.
sing our next hymn, page 219, What Child Is This?
make in reply, I do not boast that God is on my side, but I humbly pray that I am on God's side. There's a difference there. The scriptures call upon us throughout to choose God, to follow Christ, to serve the one true Lord. But do the scriptures ever say anything about whether or not God is on my side or God is on your side? Do scriptures ever ask, answer the question, whose side is God on? The Apostle Paul, in the words that I like to go to ever so often as he reminds me and reminds you that if God is for us, then who can be against us? Indicating that yes, God is for us. That God is on our side. But then there's a question. Who does Paul mean by us? Who does Paul mean by us? When the angel spoke to Joseph, re reminding him of the words spoken long before that of the prophet. The virgin will be with child, will give birth to a son. And they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Who did the angel mean by us? Clearly, during the Civil War, there are those in the north that held their Bibles tightly. And those folks claimed that God was on their side. Well, at the same time, there are those in the South that said, Oh, no, no, don't get ahead of ourselves here. The Bible declares that God is on our side. Adolf Hitler was convinced from the very beginning that what he was doing was right. Then, after an assassination attempt in which he survived, he was convinced more than anything else, that God was clearly on his side. If you're going to survive an assassination attempt, then God must be what? Looking out for you. Today, Christians declare that God is on their side. But do you know that Jews and Muslims each declare that God is on their side too? History recalls atrocities carried out in the name of the Lord for centuries. Even in recent history, you may recall an event that we refer to as 9-11. When terrorists, in their last act, declared what? Their allegiance to Allah, to God. Wow. Whose side is God on? Thousands of church denominations from here and there declare, hey, we're the one, right? God is here. God is for us. God is on our side. And we often re really reiterate that by declaring those churches down there, those people down there. Yes, God's on our side. You hear it all the time. And we like to think that God is on our side. When you think about it, if there ever were a people that had the right to declare, no, God's with us. God's our God. God's on our side. It would have had to have been the Jews. The Jewish people. After all, in the Old Testament, they are clearly defined as God's people. Very early on, I have to admit that I have trouble uh, when thinking about God choosing sides. But yet, the Old Testament says that they were God's chosen people. But does God really choose sides? If you have brothers and sisters, and you know that one of them is a favorite, you know how difficult it is. To think that parents actually choose sides. But they're, they do. I know they do. And there's nothing we can do about it when they choose sides to this day. I swear that if my baby sister Tammy starts crying, I get a phone call wanting to know what it was I did to her. 
Yet God said to the Israelites, Although the whole wide world is mine, you will be my treasured possession. I have trouble reading that. He says, if you'll keep my commandments, you do what I ask, you'll be mine, my chosen ones. To me, that's not faith. But I can't do anything about it. It's in the Bible. But does that mean that God chooses sight? I'm sure that over six million Jews who pass through Hitler's concentration camps would have to argue. I'm sure they had to wonder, oh, wait a minute here, I don't understand this. Whose side is God on? In Joshua 5.13, there is an interesting scene that I, it's just really a neat scene. Joshua is very near Jericho. If you remember the story, Joshua led the Israelites to march around the city, the walls of Jericho. And God instructed them as to what all to do. God led them, but they did what God said to do. And in the end, God did what? God handed them the city Jericho. Okay? But in this scene, as Joshua and the people are very near the, the walls, Joshua looks up and he sees a man. The man is not identified, but he is there. And Joshua sees this man who may very well have represented the Lord, or at least an angel of the Lord that the Lord had sent to represent him. And Joshua asks the man the question, are you for us, or are you for our enemies? Are you for us, or are you for our enemies? I would say that many, even today, maybe even some of you, maybe even me, have asked that question in one way or another. Are you for me, God? Or are you against me? Are you for me? Or are you against me? On 9-11, we ask the question. Is God for us? Or is God for them? Why did, when we ask the question, why did God allow this to happen? Are we not in that way, in that sense, asking the question, God, whose side are you really on? When things don't go well in our lives, when it seems like it's just all turned to you know what, we ask the question because we want to know. Because we want to know because the Bible says to us, hey, you know, God has made all these promises. The man answered Joshua. Sometimes in the Bible when people ask God questions, like Job did, they don't get an answer. Sometimes when we ask God questions, it seems that we don't get an answer. But the man answered Joshua, and the response was very interesting. Do you know what he told him? The light answered his question, are you for us or our enemies? The man answered, neither. Neither. And then Joshua asked, well, okay, but does God have a message for me? You know what the message was? Take off your sandals. Take off your shoes. For the place where you are standing is holy. That's it. That was the message. In response to the question, the answer to the question really didn't make sense. It probably wasn't the answer that Joshua was wanting to hear. A simple yes or no answer would have been sufficient, but no, neither, but take off your shoes. What kind of answer is that? Neither. Take off your shoes for the place where you're standing is holy ground. 
He didn't even take the side of the people that he had chosen. At least he said it wasn't. The people whom he, had, he would hand the city to. The people whom he made all the promises to. Didn't take a side. Not even against the enemy. Could it be that the only side that God chooses the only side that God chooses, the only side God can choose, think about it, the only side God can choose is God's side. God's will. God's way. That's problematic because we sometimes wrestle with that. We don't always like God's will. We want our will. But can it be that the only side God can choose is God's will? You do know, don't you, that only God is right. Do you know that? Only God is right. And could it be that on that morning in Bethlehem, God declared Neither. On the cross, as he died there on that cross, Jesus proclaimed, Neither. On resurrection morning, with the empty tomb, could it be that God there, through his resurrected Son, declared to the whole world to know? Neither. The genealogy that opens up Matthew's Gospel. You know, that exciting piece of literature that you can't wait to read when you're reading the Christmas story. <laughs> it's full of Jewish forefathers that are included in the lineage of Jesus. The list includes Abraham, the father of the people, David, the great king, and Joseph himself. And so, you would think that all Jews, when they read that, would declare, hey, that proves it right there, that when we talk about God for us, God's talking about us. But even the genealogy that gives us Jesus and his people, even the genealogy declares, neither. Neither. Why is that? Because even in the genealogy, God makes it clear without saying a word that even the people whom I have chosen cannot declare it's all about us. Even the people that I call my treasured ones cannot say only God, God is only for us, that when we talk about us, he's talking about just us, our people. No, because why? Because in that genealogy, there are four people that shouldn't even be there. Four Gentile women. Four non-Jewish women. And at least one of them was a sinner. Yes, Jesus' lineage, they have people like, shh, we can't talk about them. We can't talk. God declares that no, it's not just about you. Even at the birth of Jesus, when the stars shine afterwards and call the wise men to Bethlehem, God is reaching out far beyond and bringing others in. The shepherds out in the field where they washed their flock, when they came to, to worship Him, even God has called them from out in the fields. No. When it says God with them, God is declaring, I'm not on anybody's side. I'm on my side. And it very well can be that on Bethlehem morning, when that baby was born and laid in that manger, believe it or not, on that morning, have you ever been asked, ADHD Paul is kicking in here, I'll get back to that in a minute. Have you ever been asked, what do you want for Christmas? I get asked that every year, Paul, and I never even get what I want. <laughs> but you're asked the question, what do you want for Christmas? Sometimes you get what you want. Sometimes you get something you didn't know you wanted. 
<laughs> Sometimes you get something that's like, now, what am I going to do with this? Right? But on Christmas morning, could it very well have been God got what God wanted. God got what God wanted. When they laid that baby in the manger, that trough, um, which was a part of a, well, I said Wednesday night, it's where they brought the animals in at night. It was not a separate barn. It was not a place separated, separated from the living quarters where they kept animals. No, it was most likely a part of a home where in the daytime people gathered in this bottom section of the home, but at night they would go upstairs to sleep. And they might have a, a guest room, and so they'd have guests in and on this night where many people came to the city to pay their taxes, there would be no room. But yet, what did they do to the bottom quarters? They brought the animals in. They brought the animals in at night to serve two purposes. One, for protection for the animals. And two, the animals give off what? Heat. And the heat would rise and keep the sleeping people upstairs warm. And so Jesus was born there where they bring in the animals. And they lay them in a trough where they fed the animals. Think about it. The God of heaven, who once upon a time, nobody could reach. Once upon a time, God was so holy, they believed they could not even, what, look upon him. When you went into the temple to worship God, there was a two-inch thick curtain that no one could even move, much else get through, and it separated the people from the holy place. And nobody could go in there except one person one time a year, and that was a priest who had to be consecrated before he went in, and a rope tied his leg and a bell to him, so if something happened to him, they couldn't hear the bell, that would drag him out. Why? Because they couldn't go in and get him. But on this night, they laid God the Son of God, John says he was God. The God of heaven, they laid him in a manger. The lowest spot they could possibly lay him. So that why? All people, everyone could reach him. Everyone could approach him. Even the animals, even all of creation, which also is a part of this fallen thing that went on in, in Genesis, all of creation could respond to God there in that moment. What God wants? He wants us to be able to approach Him, be able to come to Him, be able to worship Him, be able to be reconciled through Him. God's not on anybody's side but God's. And what does God want? All people, you and me, to be able to be reconciled to Him and be reconciled to each other. Only through God can that happen. For there are no real sides but God's side. May God bless you on this Christmas morning. As we sing our last hymn, we invite you to sing along with us with the same time. We invite you to listen to the Spirit of God and may be speaking to you on this page. Page 218.
Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It does. It does mine too. Well, that now. Melody and I want to wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas. We uh, just realized the other day we were a little behind on Christmas cards. We're getting into the bulletin, so uh, Merry Christmas to you. And it's certainly a joy being with you. Um, be safe today and throughout this week. We have service tomorrow night at 6 p.m. And please join us tomorrow evening. Um, half an hour, 45 minutes at the most. We'll send you on your way to be with family. May God bless you with this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this glorious moment, which we have come together again in your house. As we leave here today, God, may we go, Lord, in the peace that only you can give. Watch over us and keep us in Christ's name we pray.